This is Real Estate Rookie episode 393. Financing can be a big obstacle for getting deals done, but today we will explore how a creative eye and a handle on funding will get you a deal. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie podcast, where every week, three times a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And today, we are getting into unlocking a property's potential with Chase Charifa. Now, how to target and how Chase and his wife targeted the five senses when they incorporate a secret amenity into their properties, why ground up construction is something rookies may be missing out on, and so much more. So Chase, welcome to the podcast, brother. Super excited to have you here. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Tony. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to share what we've learned and what um, what we're all about. Funny side story, Chase and I are actually neighbors. Like we literally live in the same subdivision. And, you know, he and my wife, Sarah, have like bumped into each other out walking the babies and stuff. So uh, it's excited to have someone from SoCal. Chase kind of kind of representing brother. So Chase, can we start off with you telling us about how creative you got in your real estate journey? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I guess the creativity portion came from our first property. Um, so we call it the Lightfoot Cabin. Um, funny enough, the name is not so creative. It's just the street that it's on, but, um, it, it essentially created our like brand, um, you know, Lightfoot is kind of synonymous with, with all the things that we now do. So, um, it was back in the pandemic and everyone was kind of into, I guess, quote unquote van life. And my wife and I wanted to get into that, but I guess one, you know, car dealership, um, you know, dealer said, yeah, you could use a second home loan on this. And I'm like, well, Chase, you're a lender, second home. Why am I using it on a depreciating asset? No hate on the van life people. But I was like, well, why don't we buy a actual vacation home instead? And naturally in SoCal, we think of Big Bear. So we started going up there and one day we, we went up while it was snowing and we found this property actually outside of Big Bear. And just, it was just so magical that the snow was falling and it was still, it still needed work, but it really drew us in. And that was at that point where we made an offer and then we put in all our creative work. Um, this property was built around 1960s, I believe 1965. Um, so we really wanted to go with a mid century vibe, which at the time, 2021, um, that's what we were really excited about. I knew I knew I needed one thing where this has to be a black cabin. I mean, I, I think my favorite color is black. Like my truck is black. Most of my shirts are black. Anyway, I was like, it has to be uh, a black cabin with a cedar outside. So that's kind of what we went with. And, um, we had just a feeling at the time because we were traveling that this needed to be a couple's getaway. Um, even though, you know, a lot of other people were telling us, don't paint it black, don't make it a couple's getaway, Airbnb is all about beds with heads, but we really wanted to focus in on um, the couple's getaway and also um, making the experience more than just arriving there and sleeping. So we came up with this like five senses type of thing where visually it, it'll be there, but also, our thought process was as you walk in, we wanted music to be playing. So then you would have, it would kind of fill the space a little bit more. We also put a scent near the front door that we now curate for it, um, adding to, to the five senses. Now that you have smell and you have sight, you have hearing. And then as you walk down the, to the main level, there are... Uh, fresh cookies or some sort of pastry there to, you know, incorporate that sense of taste. And then we have, we, one of my friends found a way to, um, Wi-Fi connect our gas fireplace so that we could turn it on as soon as they unlock the Schlage lock. So then now you have everything kind of into an, a well-rounded full experience as you enter. So that's kind of what we did for that space. That's awesome. So let me just ask about that fireplace real quick. It, the first thing I thought of when you said that, so are you manually manually having to 
turn the fireplace on. So you're having to watch when somebody actually checks in or did you find a way to automate that process too? Um, We haven't found a way to automate that process right now. This is the only property that we do that on. It's the one that's closest to us and it's like our, uh, our flagship property. So it's kind of the one that we try to go all out on uh, to make our portfolio look good. And I guess it's the, the one that we're, we test out the most. We try to do the most creative things on this one and see if it sticks or if it doesn't stick. Well, I, I think that's where the story may be going with you as to how these personal touches and actually having a hands-on Airbnb can be more profitable than something that's more passive. Because you listen to a lot of investors say, put your system and processes in order, automate, 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 be hands off. You don't want to have to know anything that's going on. You don't want to have to do everything, have a process or have a VA or, or have you know some kind of AI technology take care of that for you. So tell us a little bit more about what are some unique hands-on things that you are doing for this property that does take some time commitment for you, but as I hoped, and we haven't touched on this, had turned you a profit. <laughs> it has. Yeah. So um, something that you, unique that we do for our property is we have like a secret amenity. So a lot of people claim they act- they have something hidden, but you know they still um, promote it on social media. We don't at all. We, my idea was kind of like a fight club, John Wick type of thing. So um, it's it's like a secret through and through. So the day that you're going to check in, the guests get a text three hours before saying, hey, we're excited for you to come in. By the way, your adventure starts now. You're going to be going through a treasure hunt and your first clue is on the island. You know, just get started. And so it already hypes up everyone. And they're like, what is happening? My son loves amazing race. He goes, daddy, clue. You know, so like, I was like, oh, we got to leave a clue. So we created all these little letters on each one. Because when my wife and I were dating, we used to give each other treasure hunts or scavenger hunts for dates. So I was like, well, why can't we do that to guests? So make it special already. So when they arrive, they open the door, they have the five senses, and they're already so excited and so hyped. And then now there's this treasure hunt that, you know, they got texted, they go to the island and they look at the um uh the first clue and essentially it's not a very difficult treasure hunt um what it is it's a way for them to tour the property to see all the highlights of the property but through this treasure hunt so they get to see the bathroom and they get to see this mirror that we liked or we really love our slatted wall and we want to take them to the typewriter that we curated from facebook and and then they go to the record player so they know there's a record player. And then the very end is that there is a last clue where I'm a big fan of Batman. And so I love the whole hidden door thing. So we installed a hidden bookcase door um, that, that leads to the basement. And the last clue says to open that up and then it leads you to the clue. And then the clue leads you to a secret hidden cinema room. You know, so, and it has a sign that says silence is golden. So, you know, keep it hush, hush. There's a candy wall where you have all sorts of candies. There's popcorn. Um, we went all out. We did a, a laser projector thing. I forgot what it was called, but it's a hundred inch projection screen. You just have to imagine it because I'll never show you unless you stay there. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just thinking you said this is romantic getaway for couples. My kids would go crazy over the scavenger hunt and going in and finding that that movie room. <laughs> no, the last thing that I was just going to say was that we don't advertise it at all on our Airbnb listing. So there's no mention of movie room. And then we tell all our guests to just shh, like this is for you. So even when they book us, we tell them that, hey, there's so much more. And this secret amenity is for you for trusting us for picking our cabin. So Chase, I, I just looked up your, your your listing on Airbnb and you guys did a phenomenal job 
uh, 4.99 rating across almost 200 reviews just on Airbnb alone. That's hard to achieve, right? To, to hold them as a perfect five-star rating with 200 different reviews. And I'll, I'll also say, uh, I think you're incredibly brave for having such a cool amenity and not talking about it. Because as soon as we put anything in our property, the first thing we do is take pictures and put it up on the listing because we want people to know about it. Um, but you know, the, the fact you've kind of curated this experience, I think just goes to show, um, you know, what it is you're hoping, hoping to give your guests. And obviously it seems like it's working out well for you, brother. I, if we can, I, I just want to lay the, lay the table here just a bit. Um, but how, what's your total portfolio look like today, Chase? Uh, outside of the primary, we have five current uh, short-term rentals spread out through multiple states. Um, funny enough, when you were talking about the Smoky Mountains, my wife caught it back then. And that was one of the reasons why we went. So just, you know, the really cool thing when we were looking at bigger pockets initially. So we do have one in the Smoky Mountains uh, in Gatlinburg and one in Sevierville, Weirs Valley. We have one in Kentucky and also in uh, Branson, Missouri. So we have five total, but the the reason why I was breathing a little bit is because we have three new construction projects happening at the same time, kind of staggered throughout. Um, and we just closed on a land, a piece of land that we just acquired last week. So hopefully by the end of year, we'll hit nine or 10. Chase, we can maybe offer you a couple rapid fire questions here uh, to get into the numbers, but what was the purchase price on the property? The purchase price was three uh, fifty nine. dollars And how did you finance the deal? Um, I just financed it to, through our company, a second home uh, loan, because actually we didn't even think we were going to rent it on Airbnb the first time. But um, yeah, it just happened to work out. Yeah, 10% down. But the funny thing was, is in 2021, a lot of things were going over asking. And so we actually overpaid for this one um, just a bit, um, like about $5,000 because it didn't appraise for that amount of money. And then uh, the furnishings, did you pay for that out of pocket or did it come furnished? Um, I think there was a few furnish, uh, you know, fur furniture, but we mostly purchased everything new. Um we left like the stove and the and things like that. And I think we so sold the old refrigerator. Um, so we kind of sold some things and then repurchased everything ourselves. And what was the total cost of the furnishings and any rehab on the property? Furnishings and rehab was probably about sixty five thousand, which is sounds crazy to me. And I'm like, why would why would we do we didn't run numbers on this at all. Just FYI. I feel terrible because now I'm like all about running numbers for all of our other properties, but this one was purely emotional. And I feel bad for saying that, but it ended up working great. Okay. So now that the property is all renovated, um, you know, Tony, maybe you can ask better short-term rental questions as to what the gross income is, but I'll start off with what's your average daily nightly rate on this short-term rental? Um, so it varies on seasonality for sure. Um, so it could be a, a, as low as 225 and as high as $900 is the highest that we've ever gone. So what does is, what is revenue look like uh, last year for you on this property, Chase? So we acquired the property 2021. So first full year 2022 was like 130,000. It dipped down a bit in 23 to 120,000. Um, and that's a combination of direct booking, Airbnb, and surprisingly, not a lot of people know, but Gigster and Peer Space. So we do some photo shoots as well. Yeah. Especially since we're so close to LA, we've had a lot of, um, you know, photo shoots where sometimes just the day rate for eight hours exceeds like two or three nights. So sometimes it's really good in that aspect. And what did you net on that 120 for last year? Expense ratio is roughly um, 50 to 55%. So um, after mortgages and all that stuff, because again, we were pretty lucky since we obtained the property April, 2021. And after we did the renovations, we went ahead and refinanced January of 2022 before February, where they started adding in the loan level price adjustments for second homes and investment. So we got in pretty good. The interest rate on that is 3.375%. Um, yeah. So because initially at the purchase, we we purchased it at, at 4.125, but because we added lender credit. So I knew that in six months after renovations, we were going to, you know, 
refinance again. Yeah. So we wanted to acquire the property with no closing costs. Yeah. So you guys are netting somewhere in the ballpark, like 50 grand a year, which is fantastic on a property of this size, right? To have a one bedroom putting off 50 grand of profits is, is pretty crazy. Now, one, one question that jumps out to me, Chase, is as I look at your listing here, I see that you've been featured in Dwell, which is like a, a big, um, like, you know, upscale real estate type, uh, publication, Condé Nast Traveler as well. So, um, walk me through how you got your property featured in some of these, uh, publications. So, um, the first one was actually Condé Nast Traveler and it was just, um, because we gave someone a really great experience. So we, we knew that the guest coming in was an influencer. That was like our first big influencer at the time. And all she asked was, Hey, I know you have a four night minimum. Do you mind doing a three night minimum? And we said, no problem. Um, we would love to, um, uh, you know, host you. And it was for Christmas. And so uh, I don't want to say that we, we did everything right on that situation. I think it was just the perfect timing for everything, meaning, she came during Christmas and we were worried about COVID because she may not come, but she ended up coming. We thought, hey, let's go above and beyond. It's Christmas. So we we put up a Christmas tree and put Christmas decoration, but we actually um, wrapped her a gift underneath the tree. So, you know, she would already have a gift, quote unquote, from Santa. Um, and then, um, yeah, during her stay, it snowed, so it turned out really well. She loved the secret amenity. At the time, we actually didn't have the uh, secret bookshelf door. Uh, that was a later amenity. But what we used to do is we would leave music on for people to just come in, and they would have to search where that music would come from, and they would eventually find their way in to the movie room. But we added the treasure hunt later to make it even more exciting, I guess. But come to know... She was a new editor for Condé Nast and she wanted to tour all of California. And so she stayed at like, I don't know, I believe eight to 10 Airbnbs. And, you know, she's been traveling even before that. And she said that your place is my favorite and I'm going to write about it. And I'm like, she didn't even tell us. She just published it. Dude, you you just gave me like a, a an amazing idea. I'm going to, I'm going to have my team of virtual assistants log into my LinkedIn profile and just search for editors of Condé Nast, of Dwell, of like all these other like big publications and literally just offer them free saves my properties. And then if we can get them to start writing about it, that's a, that's a super, super, super efficient way to, to get some of this, this publicity. So thank you, Chase. I appreciate that, man. That's like a million dollar idea right there. That's exactly what we did for Dwell and Sunset Mag. So after that, it was just swear. So after that, we leveraged the one and I said, Hey, and I just started emailing, sending letters, calling, DM, isolated to so many DMs, but my wife was okay with it, you know? So it, it was to different editors. And she was like, I can't believe you got dwell. No way. And I'm like, yeah. So I just kept, and then it just so happened to, they said, we love it. We love this idea. We would love to write about you. And it was great. Pretty soon when we talk about building a team for short-term rentals, we're going to be adding a PR person onto the list who goes out and <laughs> solicits influencers <laughs> and magazines to write articles. <laughs> so Chase, I want to ask, what were you and your wife doing during this time frame of your life? Were you guys working? What else was going on when you purchased this property? So at this time, I was a full-time mortgage lender and my wife was also a full-time optometrist. Um, and once we um, got into it, we, I think around the time our first, our son it was about one years old and we wanted to dive in deep into it. And I told her, Hey, is this something you want to do? And she's like, well, I love it. And then let's just go all in. So she quit her optometry job so that we could go all in on real estate. I essentially had to keep my mortgage lending because it kind of went hand in hand. So, um, but yeah, so she just um, full time helps us host, you know. Oh, that's awesome. And congratulations for both of you to be able to make that possible. I mean, that really is the dream of a lot of people of why they get into real estate is being able to make that happen. Yeah. Like our main goal was just to be more present with our kids and, you know, 
you know, I asked her like, Hey, I mean, I mean, you're the doctor, you're way smarter than me. You tell me what you want to do. She goes, no, like, you know, I love being a doctor, but I can be that later. I can't be a mom of these uh, kids. And I was like, yeah. And then we both work from home and we both get to have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with the kids. And that was like our main goal. We wanted to be present. And this was a way for us to do it. I want to touch on what your roles and responsibilities are for your partnership with your wife and what hers are. I want to get to understand, are there any things that came from your previous experiences that helped you in the roles that you have today? Um, So my wife, April, is pretty much our operations manager for all the properties and also uh, our design lead now. So um, we do hire designers on our team, but because we have so many projects going on all at once, we want to make sure that she's not too spread out too thin. So she handles most of the um, messages, inventory, um, uh, some repair, um, coordination, and then mostly just conceptualizing um, our new designs because, um, you know, we're going more towards new construction. So picking material, furniture, um, and coordinating all of that. And what experience has she had that has kind of brought her to be good at design. Was it optometry? <laughs> um, well, so, so yeah, so she could, she definitely has vision. Um, so um, we, my wife and I have always been into hospitality. Like her parents have owned multiple restaurants, um, donut shops, Louisiana fried chicken. And um, hospitality was always um, her number one thing. And as we, um, uh, dated, we actually started, you know, a little side business, um, a wedding videography, photography business. Um, and you know, all that creativity from the hospitality and creativity kind of led her to this point. Cause it started off with just maybe baking or designing some cakes and then doing like, a like a mood board or doing, you know, a backdrop for someone's birthday. And then it just, slowly kept moving towards, you know, building full houses and designing full houses. So, yeah. So, so Chase, we know that your wife was, uh, the one with the vision and the, and the relationship here, but, but what about you, brother? What, what was your background like? And we know you're, you're in the lending space now, but what led you into real estate investing? My dad was an engineer. My brother is an engineer and I was going to be an engineer and I got my license or what they call EIT, but you know, um, I guess a failure at the time, um, kind of led me down this path. A failure meaning, looking back at it now, it wasn't really what you knew, it's who you knew. And back in college, I was always like, well, why are you going out networking and talking to these other people? You should be studying in the library. And I thought it was all about just knowledge only, but it doesn't help anyone if nobody knows that you know that. And so, you know, I, I couldn't get a job in lending. So then I worked part-time as a barista and then as an assistant in mortgage lending. And then, um, you know, I pretty much took whatever job I could find to make it work for our family. And then, you know, we, we started that videography business. So, um, the reason why I bring up all those things is all those things made up to what we are today, meaning the photography in Condé Nast, those are all of our photos that made it on there. And in our cabin, you know, like our lending helped us get that. And my wife's like design helped us design that. And our just pure hustle was able to get us to um, get all these publications to notice us. And we're finally coming full circle to where we are the investor or the developer that is working essentially with the engineer or the builder to create from ground up. Yeah, Chase, that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's crazy how when you look back, you can see how all the dots connect. And Steve Jobs talked about that in one of his like speeches that he gave. But it's like you can you can never identify looking forward how everything's going to connect. But looking back, you always can. So Chase, obviously you're you're in the lending space, but I, I guess how did you know that that would continue to work for you? Actually, I learned from my clients. So I had a client. And he just kept buying like every year. I was like, how are you doing this? You know, no offense. I see what your job is. I mean, you work for Trader Joe's and you're an assistant manager, but you know, 
how are you doing this? And he just showed me how, well, because I have to see his tax returns and all that. And, you know, I see it on the schedule E. I was like, how did you get this all done? And so from that client, you know, I started diving deeper into it and I said, Hey, if you have a plan in place, you can actually make things happen and understanding, you know, the lending and how it works and all the nuances allows you to scale efficiently um, and to be able to scale, even if you don't have a lot of money, you're just using it in a more impactful way. So you, you mentioned the word scale, and I think that's what I would love to, to get into, because I, I think you mentioned, Chase, you guys have five total short-term rentals. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And you've done that since 2021, which is a relatively brief period of time to move that quickly. So I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, you, you get this first property in Big Bear, absolutely crush it. When does that second property hit? And and I guess, how do you go about funding that second deal? Yeah. So um, that one was, we actually, at the time, they still allowed HELOCs on second homes. So we took a HELOC out on on after the renovations. So we essentially got our money back. And then we actually went to Joshua Tree um, because we saw that a lot of people were there. And that was kind of our catalyst in learning how to remotely manage. And so, but we got it October of 2021. And for some reason, I had this like feeling that, man, I feel like this is getting saturated and maybe, but I mean, saturation is like a taboo word, but it just felt like there was a lot of competition coming to Joshua Tree with, you know, there's people putting pools and really cool game rooms and garages, things like that, you know, with like a Mario theme. Like there's just like these amazing couples that are doing these amazing things. And I was like, oh, shoot, you know, I better go <laughs> do so. I know there are like beautiful couples out there that are smart, that are doing all these things. And so I was like, oh, shoot, I better go uh, to somewhere else. And then we thought about Smoky Mountains. And uh, an- another reason why we did that was because... um in the city that we were in, it's called 29 Palms. It the, the regulations were coming down. And I was like, well, I don't want to operate somewhere where the city's against you. In the Smoky Mountains, like they depend on that, you know? And and I love that if the county and the city is kind of supportive of it, let's go there. So we did a 1031 exchange and we moved it to the Smoky Mountains. And then Chase, real quick, can you explain what a 1031 exchange is? Please. Yeah. So 1031 exchange is just a tax deferral strategy. It, it doesn't mean that we're never going to pay taxes, just not on that transaction. So as long as it's uh, when you sell a property, an investment property and purchase another investment property, um, like for like or more expensive, then you could defer the taxes. Um, and I think there are you can it can mostly go into equity and it could pay for some closing costs. So we did have to come up with some closing costs, but most our, our entire down payment was pretty much covered to purchase that property. The next one was kind of a unique one. Again, just taking advantage of what was happening in the market. Um, I don't know. For some reason at the time, I was just like, man, I really want a Tesla. Those Teslas look cool, you know? But uh, yeah, so while we were in the Smoky Mountains, we... Um, you know, we got connected with a, a realtor. Um, her name's Madeline. And then she was discussing something about um, Kentucky. So I thought, okay, let's take a look there. Um, and then uh, fast forward a few months later, you know, one of my friends connected us to another realtor locally in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And I was like, why are we going there? And then she started explaining everything. And I was like, what's in Louisville, Kentucky besides fried chicken? She was like, well, there is the oldest running sport, uh, probably, you know, it's called the Kentucky Derby. I'm like, oh, shoot. Yeah, that's true. But that's only one event. So we wanted to go to Louisville and then we um, wanted to purchase something um, not too expensive because, you know, our budget was pretty limited at the time. And she said there was a derby. Um, there was also new concerts coming in called Bourbon and Beyond. And at the time when we were going, I was like, what is Bourbon and Beyond? And why would someone go there? Well, Bruno Mars was the headliner. So a lot of people are going to go there. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, And then there's another concert, I think a rock concert as well. But she goes, essentially, besides all that, this is where bourbon is made. And bourbon has no season. 
people drink bourbon all year long. And I was like, well, that I don't even drink. And that convinced me. So we, we went and, and look for a property. And the reason why this one is actually our most favorite deal was because, um, we found a property that was a single family, um, but it was on an oversized lot. And why we were so excited about that was my agent kept telling me, my agent, Miley Corona kept telling me, Hey, I think you could split that and you could sell it off and you would be in this deal like no money. I was like, oh, or better yet, you could split that lot and build on it. I was like, no way. Like, I can't even fathom that. Is that possible? She goes, you know, let's do our due diligence. So we did. We looked for a surveyor. He double checked it, checked with the city and he was all good. We made an offer and we closed on it. I I have to highlight one thing that you said was you checked with the city and they okayed it. How important that piece is during your due diligence period to actually, or even before making the offer, is to check to see if you're actually going to get approval, whether from the code enforcement officer, the planning board, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. That was a scary part because I was like, oh, Um, but the nice thing was no matter what, it was still still a good property, but we we really wanted that extra value. So we wanted to check and, you know, learning about the zoning laws and their density calculations was really critical in making sure that this deal was amazing. And once we closed on the deal, the one thing that we didn't know was that subdividing and all that was actually very easy. The most difficult part that people don't understand is about what's called partial release. So what that is, is whenever you purchase a property, whether it's oversized lot or not, the lien is on the total property. So even if you subdivide it, there's still a lien on the old lot and old house or existing plus the new subdivided lot. The lien is over all of them. It's a whole blanket. And some lenders do not allow partial releases until after a year. So in this case, our lender would not allow it to be done until a year. So we had to wait a year. Then we had to apply. They had to do an appraisal to ensure that the subdivided lot you know, what was the remainder can still comp with the area. Luckily for us, we did all that research. We put a presentation together for the lender. They loved it. And they said, you're right. The comps show that it's there. It's actually increased in value. And so to release it, it was only about like $10,000. So we got a lot for 10,000, which is great. Chase, one one quick follow-up on that. Um, you said that you you gave a presentation to the lender was this a was this like a, a local regional lender or, or who was this that you were able to give a presentation to? It was a servicer. And what I meant by a presentation was more than just writing an email. So I actually put a report together where I put like my purpose and my goals. I researched comps with my realtor. I put, you know, you know, comparisons on a on a grid of a gross living area versus the main topic was this the square footage of the lot and that, you know, by removing that excess lot, it doesn't degrade the property. It's actually still comp what pretty well. And so that's what I wanted to show. So biggest question is the the numbers on this thing. You go through all of that, like how does it actually perform once you once you finish off this process? Yeah, that one. So at this point now we're actually running numbers and <laughs> we want to make sure that it, it does well. So this was a 300,000 um, purchase. And our goal is always 20% gross ROI, um, meaning 20% of the purchase price. Um, so this did 70K. Um, so it did pretty well. And we put in about 25, no, no, sorry. 25,000 furniture and about 10,000 in renovations because we renovated the bathroom and did paint and and you know, light fixtures and things like that. And so the return on it is, is really great. Um, and we only sleep six in that one. Um, but the, the great thing is that now we're able to partially release the other side and they actually just put up framing and roofing this week. So we're actually building a duplex on the other side because due to the density calculations, we, we thought we were only going to build a house, a single family, but because the surveyor and I, checked it ahead of time. When we did the density calcs, they say, oh, this is an R6 property, which means once you split it, you can theoretically put a duplex on there. So we're doing a two bed, two bath duplex each unit 
And that was just a praise of an ARV of uh, 475. And we got a construction loan for the build, which was like 330. And so that's like instant equity with nothing out of pocket. Yeah, Chief. So one uh, question I have on this, are you going to that duplex? Is that going to be long-term rental or is that going to be more short-term rentals? Um, we have two options. So we can't do another short-term rental in the area because Louisville has very strict uh, guidelines to short-term rentals. So you could only have like a one short-term rental per 600 feet. So for that one, it would have to be a midterm rental, which is great in that area because there's actually um, five hospitals around the area. There's not as much demand for nurses anymore, but that is still an option. But our, our goal is to actually do long-term rental because um, renting is pretty limited there. And when we tried to put our main single family house, which is the left side on um, long-term rental, we were able to garner activity at like 2,400 and, and that's a three bedroom. So maybe getting this at 21 or 2,200 each unit would be a pretty big win. And then what do you, what is going to be your cash flow average? You know, I know you can't say specifically, but what will be your average cash flow for these three units when everything is said and done and they're all occupied and rented out? Yeah. So I think for the duplex, it's somewhere between um, a thousand to two thousand. So let's say fifteen hundred. So it is at eighteen thousand net on that because it'll be a long term. And then the other one is about a fifty or so percent expense ratio as well. So let's say around thirty. So forty eight thousand cash flow between these two. So that's net after expenses. So I would say it's not that bad for you know such a small investment. So just last last thing I want to call it about this, right? So you 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 found this market almost by like happenstance, just through having conversations. And for me, I, I think it can be overwhelming as a rookie investor to look at a map of the United States and see nineteen thousand different cities and try and choose the one that aligns best with your goals. And I love the process of talking to other people who know these markets really well, whether it be agents or investors and getting a firsthand account of their experience in those markets. I went to the Smoky Mountains initially because I had a friend who bought there. I went to Joshua Tree for similar reasons. We, we bought, so like you start to identify, hey, someone's already laid the roadmap for me here. Let me use that as a, as a proof of concept to say this works well for me. Because you're in California where I'm at, have you ever heard of Shelbyville, Kentucky before you bought out there? Probably not, right? But as you've identified, there is a market there that supports this type of business. So I just, I just want to make sure we highlight that for Ricky listeners because it's it's a sticking point for a lot of people is choosing the right city. But I think, Chase, you exemplified a great way to kind of navigate around that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, a lot of people do wonder why we spread out into so many, you know, markets, but I really enjoy it one for our family. Cause whenever we go on vacation, we get to go to all these different cool places. But, um, I think once you get a process down, the city is just another variable in your process and your operations, research the market, you know, find your team, you know, deploy that team. And, you know, I think, um, you know, varying your investments kind of balances out your portfolio. Cause if you think about it, Big Bear is a winter market, and so we do really well during that winter time frame, which is great to balance like the Smoky Mountains because after New Year's, it's pretty slow till spring break. So it kind of holds over on that. So we're not really negative during that time frame. And then, you know, during the summer where Big Bear is slightly slower, we're picking it up in the Smokies. So it's it's a really nice like complementary, um, you know, portfolio, I guess. Chase, as we wrap up here, we always put uh, each guest information into the show notes. And, you know, our rookies love to reach out to the guests and ask questions. So let me ask you this. What are your superpowers that rookies could reach out to you and learn from you? What are some of the things that you think that you stand out on and you would love to educate other people about? Yeah, um, I think it's it's two things now. It's... Um the the photography and like the marketing aspect of it like how to best show your property on Airbnb and and how to take photos and and how to maximize whatever amenities you have and also um building i mean i don't know if it's a superpower yet but man i am working hard to make it a superpower shoot i mean every developer had to start sometime 
So and Chase, I think that's that's that actually leads into my next question, right? Because you've talked about the new builds a little bit, but I, I guess how do you how do you vet the actual construction crew that's doing the building, especially if you're going into these new markets you've never been into before? What is your process for building the team to, to support the new development? Just like what I said before, you, you, the network is what really you know determines it. You know, a lot of references um, help out a lot. And also, surprisingly, sometimes you know, I can't do every loan. And so what I actually say is for construction or commercial, local is pretty good. Um, so we work with a local credit union or a local bank because that's more re a relation type of thing. And the reason why I say that is they have the construction products that you may want. And they're already approved with many builders that around the area. So why that's key is um, if they're already approved, that means they've already vetted all these builders. They've already done projects with them. And I don't know if you know the construction process, but there are three steps to it um, with the lender is it's builder approval, project approval, and then borrower approval. So the builder approval is usually the hardest part. They actually, they run their credit. They want to make sure they're they have the experience, they have the liability insurance and the liquidity to be able to build these projects. And then it goes on to the project approval, your specific project with your plans and all that, and then the borrowers. And if your builder is already approved, what a great reference to ask that lender, have there been any issues with this builder with any of your clients? Because they're most likely going to know. Um, I built a house and we had a phenomenal builder. There was no issues. But if there was an issue, I would have went to my lender and say, hold the draw. Like, I don't want him to be paid yet. Like these things need to be done. The lender is most likely going to know there was a hold up in the timeline. If something wasn't done correctly and their inspector came out and said, no, don't give out the draw. This needs to be fixed or this isn't done yet. So that's also a great reference point, too, is asking your lender if they know of any bad experiences or great experiences on this uh, builder that's already been approved by them. Yeah. And then, you, you know, what people don't realize is that they have their own team. And then if you get embedded in that team, everything goes so smooth. Like in Kentucky, when we're building the duplex, the builder is friends with the lender and the lender knows the surveyor. And so all three just made all the permits go smoother with the, with the city and they already know the process of the draws and yeah, everything's going faster than, you know, scheduled because, you know, everything's just smoother with them already. They're all familiar with one another. Well, if you guys listening want to learn from Chase before he becomes a nationwide builder and you can't even get in contact with him, uh, we're going to put his information into the show notes so you can reach out to him if you have questions um, or want to learn more about him and his process. So Chase, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Real Estate Rookie. I'm Ashley, he's Tony, and we'll see you guys next time. Still, yeah.